everyone. Uh, my name is Sana. I'm working at the Texas Foundation, an entity of Spanish Red Cross and Spanish Vodafone Foundation. Welcome to everyone. And I am with my colleague Camille from the French Red Cross. We're going to this new 45 minutes event. For those of you who don't know uh, what uh, are 45 minutes, are a regular online events uh, open to everyone and try to shed light on social innovations developed within and outside the Red Cross Red Crescent Network. You can find more about that uh, of these different social innovations on the Red Social Innovation website that we update each week uh, new solutions. See the link, please, in, in the chat. Uh, before we start, I would like to mention that we will record the webinar and publish it on our YouTube channel. Uh, now it's being broadcast in real time because sometimes with the Zoom connection some people have uh, several uh, problems uh, so we hope it's okay for everyone otherwise you could turn off the camera uh, i leave the floor to my partner camille and uh, because of today our topic is about the climate uh, how is the weather in rome camille <laughs> that's a very good question it's actually very beautiful but you are mute can you hear me no, it's uh, actually very beautiful uh, here in Rome, but it wasn't the case yesterday. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so basically the, the theme of today is climate change mitigation. So we are a few weeks following the COP26 in Glasgow and, and a few months uh, following the release of the last IPCC reports. Um, and so uh, today the question we want to, to answer is uh, how can we decarbonize uh, social and humanitarian actions in order to um, maintain the rise of the temperature below 1.5 degrees uh, compared to pre-industrial uh, levels. So over the next 45 minutes, uh, we will listen to four pitches, one from the Japanese Red Cross Society and three other from uh, social enterprises coming from Nigeria, the UK and France, in order to know more about concrete examples um, on the field that could inspire us uh, to reduce uh, our carbon footprints. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask any of your questions in the chat. We really want to, this uh, end of the event to be interactive, so we will take a time to answer a few of your questions. Um, but now I'm very honored to uh, give the floor to our two partners. Um, uh, one is uh, Sakai Suzuki, who is publisher uh, at the Stanford Social Innovation uh, Review, and uh, who will do a, a small introduction of the topic, and who will also do an interview um, uh, of uh, one uh, of our other partner, who is Fleur Monasso, senior manager at the Red Cross uh, Red Crescent Climate Center. So thank you both uh, for this introduction and uh, enjoy everyone the, the event. Okay, the floor. Can you hear me? Very yes, good. we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sakai Suzuki, publisher of Stanford Social Innovation Review, Japan. We are the fifth language edition in the growing global partner of Stanford Social Innovation Review. This is very exciting that we are growing this network to address social issues and bring social innovation to different parts of the world. And I am also very excited to join this webinar on climate change mitigation. A climate change issue has been my interest for a long time. I joined the Rio Earth Summit in 1992. It was a very exciting event to join. It was my first time in Brazil. Uh, it was the first global conference to discuss global warming. Around that time, Al Gore published Earth and Balance, a book uh, and a series of slideshows that he was showing around, which all became the film Inconvenient Truth uh, several years later. Um, during that conference, I remember that we were cautiously optimistic that we were able to slow down the ozone hole destruction by reducing or controlling the carbon fluoro uh, chlorofluorocarbon emissions, CFC emissions. 
I don't know how many of you remember that day, those days, but uh, by governments and countries and industries all working together, we were able to reduce CFCs and ozone hole is still intact. We also talked about global warming, that this is a very big problem that's coming up. Uh, but we also thought, or at least I did, is that we just need to be very careful that we should reduce the house gas emissions and we should be okay. Steady progress has been made since then. And after the Rio Earth Summit, there was the Kyoto Accord in 1997. Uh, unfortunately, that was not supported by a few countries, uh, but progress was made. And in uh, 2015, there was the Paris Accord. The, key, the clock keeps moving forward. And today in 2021, uh, there is COP26, uh, 30 years after the Rio Earth Summit. Unfortunately, Japan won Fossil of the Day Award from the Climate Action Network. Uh, after all the discussion, speaking of the, all the resolutions agreed at COP26, President Alok Sharma commented, today we can say with credibility that we have kept 1.5 degrees within reach but its pulse is weak and it will only survive if we keep our promises, if we translate commitments into a rapid action. A year earlier, Greta Thunberg commented, leaders are happy to set targets for decades ahead, but flinch when immediate action is needed. Governments can talk, we can set carbon taxes, we can change regulations, but in the end, we have to act and change our routine. I think that's the only way to make changes happen and to reduce uh, carbon greenhouse gas emission and to keep 1.5 degrees. It is very good to hear that Red Cross and Red Crescent are thinking and working together to take specific tangible actions. And that's why I'm very excited today to be joining this webinar to hear about all the actions you're taking and hopefully uh, these will change into results that would keep 1.5 degrees within reach. Before moving on, I'd like to introduce Fleur Monasu, a Senior Program Manager at Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center. And I'd like to have a few questions uh, with her. Fleur, very nice to meet you here. Uh, you might still be on mute. Fleur, could you speak? I'm not sure. We can't hear you, Fleur. Can you hear me now? Yes. Ah, yes. Very good. Very good. I can hear you now. Okay. So I have a couple of questions for you, Fleur. Um, climate change adaptation is at the heart of Red Cross Red Crescent activities. Can you briefly explain the difference between mitigation and adaptation and why national societies should commit to reducing their carbon footprint? I'm not sure. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I hope the sound and the connection will stay okay. okay. Uh, so uh, the easiest way to explain the difference between mitigation and adaptation is that mitigation aims to address the causes of climate change and adaptation aims to address the impacts of climate change. So mitigation looks at emission reduction Adaptation looks at the humanitarian, addressing the humanitarian consequences of climate change. So while the mitigation agenda is important for all institutions in the world now, and ever more so the institutions with high level of emissions, the adaptation agenda is very important for organizations like ours that aim to reduce humanitarian risks and vulnerabilities, including disasters, agricultural issues, health, livelihoods, development, ecosystem issues. So, um, while looking at Red Cross practices on the ground and the interventions around resilience and disaster risk reduction, we often see that there are many gray lines between the two agendas of adaptation and mitigations. But it's also important to note at the same time that in the negotiations, in the international negotiations, but also within the finance mechanisms, these two agendas are set up separately. And this is also why we felt it's important to call for an equal balance of attention for finance and, 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 and policies for adaptation and mitigation. 
And in the Paris Agreement, and again now in the Glasgow Pact, this balance was established, and that's good. But it doesn't mean, however, that this is also happening in practice. Uh, the commitments are made on paper, like you already said, Sake, but it's now really, really important that we tackle the strong imbalance in available funding for vulnerable people in developing countries or in fragile states, for instance, to also adapt to climate. Because um, in practice, it's not happening. And it's estimated now, for instance, by the Oxfam Shadow Report and by others, that only 10% of climate finance reaches local adaptation efforts, which is far in. So that's why we continue to hammer occasionally on uh, the attention for adaptation. Uh, and with regards to the practice on the ground, again, within the Red Cross in vulnerable areas, again, our resilience or health or DRR programs, for instance, we always also like to see a very balanced approach, especially if we uh, witness that now the, 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 the intervention with co-benefits for adaptation and mitigations are being much often, much more often explored. Win-win of adaptation and mitigation. But however, if we really design interventions to reduce risks while scoping several interventions at the same time that can absorb carbon, we always need to prioritize around the effectiveness for risk reduction. So next example might be, we, we really need to pick a type of tree which maybe doesn't absorb the most carbon, but it might be the best choice. Apologies. Can you still hear me? Sakai, can you see? Really? Uh, you're very, you're, you're breaking up, yes. Now she's on mute as well. Where are you? Apologies. I see that there is a big lack in the connection. I can try and change my network and then I can re-enter. But I really apologize for this. Okay. Okay, so it sounds like Fleur is changing her network. Yeah, let's let's wait a, a few seconds to see if she can join. Unless Sane is among here, among us from the climate center, but I'm not sure. Yes, I am indeed here, but I I don't know what Fleur was supposed to be um, speaking to, or I think she will in the next minute or so. Let's give her a minute. So we have quite a few people joining this event. 58 people from around the world. Definitely. Maybe if she doesn't join, I would um, suggest that we move with the first speech and then we can come back uh, to her if that's okay for everyone because I don't want to go over time. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, to start, uh, I think we uh, all know that uh, carbon mitigation um, is a subject that uh, can be um, developed to in different sectors, starting with the digital sector, because we don't uh, usually speak a lot about the carbon emission of the digital. And to start this event, uh, we wanted to give the floor to a social enterprise uh, based in France, uh, who is working on this very specific uh, topic. So I'm very happy to, to give the floor to Quentin Laurent uh, from Carnot Computing, um, who will uh, presents his solution uh, to everyone. Quentin, I give uh, you the mic. Thank you very much, Camille. Thanks everyone for uh, uh, listening to my presentation. Um, I am Quentin Lawrence, the head of uh, external and international relations at Carnot, a French company based uh, close to Paris, um, which uh, decided 10 years ago to be launched to tackle 
uh, one issue which, which was not as known as today, uh, the digital pollution that Camille just mentioned. Uh, digital pollution is just um, all the pollution generated by our uh, everyday usages of um, IT, uh, the streaming that we are currently doing, the phone that we're using, uh, the networks that we are um, uh, using too, the data centers that are providing us uh, the services that uh, are required for uh, uh, Netflix, for uh, cloud, cloud, for cloud computing, for mails and so on. Um, what Carnot decided to do especially is to uh, propose an answer and an alternative to data data centers, uh, which are these huge uh, digital factories. I could, I could maybe give you a figure to talk about digital pollution. Um, uh, this is today representing 10% of the uh, uh, digital uh, activities in general, 10% of the uh, overall energy consumption in the world, and 4% of the uh, gas emissions, which is already huge and which should be uh, even uh, more huge in, in several uh, years, of course. So um, I mentioned that Carnot was trying to propose and to solve one part of that issue uh, by creating a model which is an alternative to data centers. Um, I can maybe share um, a little part of my uh, screen so that you can easily understand what we are doing. Um, so uh, I hope everyone sees what I'm, I'm showing. Um, what we try to do is to propose um, a model uh, which is not the one that you have on the screen, uh, the one of data centers, uh, that concentrate all uh, computers within one place uh, in big data centers that you have on the picture. Um, and all this concentration brings uh, computers to, to, to release lots of heat because a computer that works releases heat. And uh, it's uh, not often that the, the waste heat from IT is reused uh, in, in a, I would say, a virtuous way. So um, moreover, data centers have to be refreshed uh, for one reason is that if it gets too hot, uh, there is no chance uh, that the, the computer can, can still work. So the model of Carnot was to propose an, um, a distributed approach of computing by spreading IT power directly within buildings uh, that could reuse and that could benefit from this waste heat from IT. Uh, that means that we are uh, using um, buildings where you have offices, housing, public buildings, heat networks, swimming pools that require heat uh, in winter or for uh, everyday usages for water. Uh, this approach has many uh, arguments and benefits. And uh, to realize that uh, projects, uh, we decided to launch one, some, some products and uh, a software that allows us to distribute uh, computing tasks regarding the heat which is uh, expected by our, our customers. So what you have to understand is that we, we work with two kinds of clients that I'll, I'll be a bit more precise right after. Computing clients that are just buying computing power as they would do with a common cloud provider, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, and so on. And we work with uh, offices, public buildings, warehouses, and so on that require heat. And the, the model of Carnot uh, is based on these two legs. Um, the first leg is uh, that waste heat is generated. The second leg is that heat is expected. And uh, we distribute computing power throughout the cities and uh, the countries uh, like this. And on, your, on the right side of, the, of my screen, you see uh, computing heaters and computing boilers that are uh, uh, products that embed microprocessors uh, as heat sources. Uh, that means that you have here a small part of a data center, the, the computing heater or the computing boiler is a small part of a data center that can uh, make a big uh, computational task run on it. And the heat which is generated by servers will be reused. To give you a concrete example of uh, people we are working with, you have uh, 3D movies uh, that are um, using uh, our uh, computing power. So we, for example, we, we did render that um, Minions movie. Uh, we also worked on COVID, on uh, genetics, um, and, um, and on uh, many other, uh, especially with, with banks for um, risk analysis. And on the right side, you have the heating clients that are just requiring heat, as I just mentioned. And I wanted to, to focus on one uh, special project that, that is important for us. It's, it's the, the heat networks, um, which uh, are using uh, heat uh, all day long and all year long. So we are producing heat for that. Um, one project is, is, um, is uh, currently working because there are people uh, all around the world. Some people need heat in winter, but also um, uh, colds in, in summer. So we are currently developing a new product, which could reuse that waste heat to produce colds 
as the, the, the fridge does, you need hot to, to, to produce a, a coal. And just to finish and to give the floor to, to the next entrepreneur, um, I wanted to highlight that this model is not just uh, inventive or innovative, it's also very efficient in terms of, uh, of course, in terms of philosophy, but also in terms of uh, carbon emissions. And I think this is this is precisely the, the subject of today. And um, we launched a, um, a carbon fact methodology that allows us uh, to count and to measure very precisely uh, what uh, uh, computational task will uh, consume or will release in terms of carbon and energy. So this is uh, based on the nutrition facts that you may find in, in Northern America. Um, but uh, this looks like this, and this shows, uh, this is a good example that we uh, reused and we reduced the emissions by 88% for uh, one of our projects there. The average is around uh, 80%, uh, so that means that um, by uh, developing that circul digital circular economy model in which the waste from some uh, customers becomes the resource of others, we are able um, to um, tackle uh, the issue of the digital pollution and to accelerate uh, the energy transition. Uh, I'd be glad to answer your questions. I think I was a bit long, uh, but thank you very much for your, um, uh, for, for your kind uh, uh, questions, if you have some. Thank you. Thanks, Quentin. Wow, really impressive. This is uh, first project that we are uh, knowing today. Maybe at the end, we are going to have time uh, for several questions and to come back to Flair and go deeply with the Climate Center. And now let's move to the Japanese Red Cross now to see how the Red Cross National Society uh, is starting to reduce the carbon footprint of its emergency actions. I would like to introduce Sosino Yusiro, Director of International Medical Relief Department at the Kumamoto Hospital of Japanese Red Cross. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from Japan. So it's a great pleasure to be with you today for introducing our project with Toyota. To be honest, in my private life, I drive my own car super for more than 20 years, but in my past Red Cross missions, I always took Toyota Land Cruisers and sometimes donkeys for green response. This is our Kumamoto Hospital located in the southern part of Japan. And in, and in 2000, our hospital is appointed as an international medical relief hub hospital in the Japanese Red Cross. Red Social Innovation introduces our project on use of vehicles, medical cargo drones, and our innovation model. So please visit after this seminar. Recently, our hospital is recognized as an open innovation hub for humanitarian technologies. What is a humanitarian technology? Until quite recently, our definition was technology for saving life alleviate human suffering, and protecting human dignity, which is exactly the same goal of the Red Cross. Um, however, now we need to add environmentally friendly technology. In our innovation model, serendipity plays a key role in networking. In 2014, we invented an evacuation support system by using mobile app to ensure the necessary transportation and accommodation in emergencies. To realize this idea, we joined various meetings on mobility services. And last year, one of the members of mobility services in meetings introduced our hospital to Toyota. And this year, we launched a joint project on medical fuel vehicles. This project aims to prove the effectiveness of the application of fuel cell vehicle technology in medical and disaster response. Before we start this joint project, we had online meetings to share the common challenges in disaster affected areas, for example, just outside of the refugee centers, several large relief vehicles were deployed and produced a large noise and exhaust gas, which is really annoying. The benefit of fuel cell vehicles are comfortable drive, actually much better than donkeys, and zero emission in driving, rapid high voltage charging time, and power supply function in emergencies as a mobile power plant. Last month, we deployed the ambulance to disaster response training in Okinawa, and we use the ambulance to inflate a tent instead of using a generator. In addition, we use the ambulance as a drone operation room by collecting the real-time data from the drone. Also, 
we conducted a field test on power supply to the clinical equipment and we evaluated the quality of the electricity provided by the vehicle. In this way, fuel cell technology can be applied to improve our field hospital services in the future. Furthermore, by daily uses of these mobile power plants as a disaster preparedness, we can contribute to build up the zero emission and resilience city in the future. Since fuel cell vehicles are advanced technology, multiple solutions are needed to cover the different parts of the world, such as rural areas of Japan, where hydrogen is not available. So we are doing the field test of a second hybrid vehicle with power supply functions for developing country and also rural areas of Japan, which is actually these vehicles are relatively affordable compared to fuel cell vehicles. So this model shows our approach towards a contribution to decarbonization in humanitarian services. As a professional humanitarian organization, we should focus on how to improve our humanitarian services. So firstly, we need to visit the real place, Gemba in Japanese, to identify challenges. Secondly, together with our other partners, we co-create the environmentally friendly solution. This co-creation improves our humanitarian services and the contribution to decarbonization follows if we correctly co-create the new solutions. As Toyota says, let's make the ever better car. Our medical fuel cell vehicle is a flagship vehicle that represents our attitude towards a better humanitarian services. So how can we, humanitarian organization, contribute to decarbonization? The current approach mainly focuses on improving logistic efficiency. However, in addition to these efforts, we want to propose a new approach by co-creation of environmentally friendly solutions to improve our humanitarian services. In conclusion, the contribution to carbon neutral can be followed by passing the better humanitarian services. It's important to co-create the multiple environmentally friendly solutions and use them in the suitable places. And co-creation and learning from various stakeholders improves our own humanitarian services. That's all of my presentation. Thank you very much. And if you have a contact, you can contact me by email. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sushinasan. Very, very interesting. And um, without losing more time, we will go to uh, Nigeria now uh, to discover a social enterprise working on the theme of circular economy. So I'm very uh, happy to give the floor to Esther Nawali, member of the Fair Plastic Alliance. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My name is Esther, and I work with Fair Plastic Alliance as the Programs and um, Development Manager. Um, my interest in climate change has been for years, since I was in junior secondary school, since my teen years. So um, this is a very interesting topic for me to talk about. So the Fair Plastic Alliance is an alliance of people, entities, and organization, and we are engaged in building an inclusive circular economy. We're trying to develop a business model for plastic recycling that is designed to create a positive and social environmental impact. We're trying to build a fair value chain for everybody on the recycling value chain, especially those people that struggle to keep the environment clean, which are the waste workers, the people on the field, the sorters. And then, um, so in 20, we started off in 2020, and when we started, we tried to visit a couple of dump sites, a couple of um, waste companies to see what they are doing and see the condition that they work with. And one of the things we noticed is, the health condition of the workers, the condition in which they work in, in Nigeria is sunny. And most of the time these workers work under the sun. And then we don't have a proper waste management system here. So more like all kinds of waste are kept together. And then with COVID-19, we discovered that the health risk of most, of, uh, most waste workers has increased because now you are mixing medical waste with other forms of waste and then there are, there, are, there are waste workers on the field that try to separate this waste and then segregate this waste to um, earn a living. So we're trying to make life better for them. 
And with the help of our partners in 2021, we're able to have a medical outreach where we registered over 1,850 waste workers. And then we gave um, about 1,500 of them um, free medical care. We also gave them raw food for them and their family members. We gave them clothing items. And we had um, safety trainers who talked to them about their health and their safety, the importance of wearing PPEs, because a lot of them don't have because they don't have enough money to buy. And where they work, sometimes there's more or less um, individuals working for themselves. Some of the tests that we did were um, blood sugar, um, body mass index, we did um, blood pressure, we did um, malaria tests as well. We did in five different locations in Nigeria. We did uh, two locations in Lagos, the biggest dump site in Lagos, Nigeria. That is the Olusosun dump site where we registered over 600 waste workers. We went to a recycling company, um, um, Recyclers, where we had about 200 waste workers. We went to another one in Ogun State, Nigeria, where we had about 50 waste workers. And then we went to Abuja, went to the Gosa dump site, as well as Akko dump site, where we had about 600 and 400, that's about 1,000 in Abuja. At the end of our medical outreach, we discovered that about 26% of them had malaria, and a lot of them had body pain. Most of them were obese, and you know, the blood pressure was really high, and a lot of them were infected with bacteria and other infections. So, we are now we're coming up with another strategy where we would have like um, medical vans that can go from dump site to dump site or waste organization, waste recycling organizations, so they can give. And we're all trying to, um, you know, talk to recycling companies, talk to the companies that produces these recyclables so that we can gain more values for the recyclables and they will be able to earn more. We work with different partners, um, Bestella Foundation, Frederick Norman Foundation, Unilever Fibra. Then we have also worked with some um, young people that are interested in climate change, but might not know how to go about it. So we try to train them and put them forward to best training. In October, we had some of our members represented in South Africa for the circular economy training. And um, this is what we do at Fair Plastic Alliance. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Esther. Uh, really inspiring alliance that you are now starting there. And yeah, uh, now and um, to finish this cycle of pits, we would like to introduce another social enterprise that just launched a reliable solution of lighting that does not rely on fossil fuel and that can be used in case of emergency. Uh, please welcome Chris uh, Skilton, uh, CEO of DesiWatt. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be talking to all of you. Uh, as I said, my name is Chris. I'm the CEO of DesiWatt. Our business designs renewable energy products that harness human efforts and turn it into electricity. We do this because, incredibly, there are still about 800 million people who still have no access to electricity and many of them rely on kerosene for lighting. Um, this presents several problems. First, it's expensive and can consume up to 20% of household income. It's also dangerous, uh, it creates, causes respiratory illness and can cause household fires. And of course, burning kerosene uh, relevant to, days, to, to, to this theme uh, is also bad for the environment and a significant source of CO2 emissions. The great news is that over the last decade, millions of people have gained access to electricity for the first time, thanks to low cost off grid solar products. Uh, on the other hand, the limitation of solar products is, of course, that they rely on sunlight, which creates two problems. The first is that sunlight simply is not available all of the time. If you rely on solar electricity and run out of power at night, you can't generate more electricity until morning. But even during the day, if you live in a country that has, for example, a long rainy season, 
due to high cloud cover, there could be a period of several months every year where you're routinely not able to gather enough electricity to meet your needs from solar, which means that you might revert to using something like burning a candle or lighting a kerosene lamp. Um, and so to address these uh, problems, we uh, have created a product called Nowlight, which is probably easier to show you at the same time as describing. And the idea is that by pulling on a loop of cord, you're turning an alternator and generating up to 20 watts of electricity, which you can use for lighting and charging small devices. If you pull the cord for just a minute, you'll create up to two hours of light or enough power for a 15 minute phone conversation. And a fully charged now light can provide 90 hours of light or enough power to fully charge a typical smartphone. Uh, and while turning human effort into electricity is not a new idea, a uniquely efficient biomechanical design means that now light creates far more power than alternatives like wind up torches while remaining a uh, small and practical device. Um, it's important to note that we see now light as a complement to rather than an alternative to things like solar power. And uh, in fact, now light is normally supplied with a solar panel and it can also uh, be charged. Uh, from USB power sources. And what that means is the now light user can take advantage of sunlight and grid electricity when they are available, but crucially, um, they don't have to uh, rely on them. And we recently ran a trial in Pakistan, and what we found was that although people can charge now light with the solar panel most of the time, uh, typically, users pulled the cord to create power at least three times per week, and that's three times they didn't have to light a candle uh, or a kerosene lamp, uh, reducing CO2 emissions and household expenditure. Uh, the big question is, in net terms, does now light represent an environmental benefit? And at the moment, we are working with the Carbon Trust in the UK to ascertain the true footprint of uh, now light in carbon terms and also over what kind of time frame it could actually be a net positive for the environment where it is displacing candles or kerosene. Uh, you may be interested to know that the Red Cross um, has played quite an important role uh, in now light. Uh, early prototypes of the product were tested in, in refugee settlements in Rwanda and Uganda, and we've actually started to work with the Red Cross now. Last year, our customers donated 100 now lights for inclusion in ORP kits, which are used to establish uh, mobile rehydration clinics in the event of cholera outbreaks. And in this context, what having a now light means is a truly reliable source of electricity. If it's sunny, the clinic staff can use the solar panel, but if it's not sunny, they can pull the cord. And one way or another, night or day, whatever the weather, uh, that clinic is going to have access to lighting. And also this highlights another major benefit of, of now light, which is its, its suitability for emergencies and disaster zones. Um, because you don't have to charge in advance, it's always ready. And in fact, um, in the next couple of months, we're going to also going to be sending 400 now lights to uh, Uganda, where the Red Cross uh, locally will be deploying them uh, for camp infrastructure in refugee settlements, as well as providing individual households uh, with a source of electricity. Um, if there is anyone who'd like to learn more about now light, uh, I'd be delighted to talk to you and you can contact me using the contact details that you can see on the screen there. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Chris, uh, for this presentation. So I think we will also uh, send, if it has not been done already, the link uh, towards your website uh, on the chat. Um, so we have uh, five minutes uh, left. Maybe we can uh, give the floor to Sakai and Fleur um, to uh, try to finish the questions we, we started. Uh, and then we can take a few questions if you have. Sakai. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And Fleur, I hope you'll be able to join here. Um, and Fleur, uh, thank you very much for the explanation on mitigation and adaptation. I'd like to uh, ask you one more question. Uh, when talking about climate change mitigation, we usually say that countries have common but differentiated responsibility. Is this principle reflecting the vision of Red Cross Red Crescent Network? 
Thank you so much and apologies for the internet uh, problems. But yes, absolutely. This is also for us, I think, very important. Uh, common and, uh, but differentiated responsibilities basically mean that countries determine their own commitments towards reducing their emissions. So each country defines their own level of reductions aligned with their abilities, resources and their current emissions and their pathways of development. But yes, it's really also um, important for the Red Cross, in my view, and especially when we talk about the implementation on the ground in vulnerable areas, it's really important to keep in mind that if we heavily promote intervention because they reduce carbon, we'll need to acknowledge that in these most vulnerable and poorest places on Earth, they contribute the very, very least to global emissions. So therefore asking them to change behavior towards cleaner practices is not always fair and it should be balanced carefully with other humanitarian priorities that they face. Mm -hmm. um, so lastly, I think also countries that are now increasingly looking at the concept of making a just energy transition, this is also important for us. A just transition means that we also need to look carefully who the new vulnerable groups are in a country. So when a just energy transition is implemented, there may be new groups at risk. For instance, miners who lost their job or entire regions without livelihoods because of closing down of sectors. So shifting, for instance, to renewable energies. It will be important for us to continue to understand how vulnerabilities across populations are shifting within these just transitions and, for instance, engage more in dialogues around social protection schemes or safety nets, which will also become increasingly important in this context. Thank you. Thank you, Fleur. Thank you very much. And let, let us uh, hand back to Camille. Thank you, Sergei, and thank you so much, Fleur. Um, and uh, I see in the chat that we have one question for Chris. Um, so please don't hesitate if you have other questions. So I read it out loud. Now light is relatively costly, 109 pounds. Are there attempts to have a distribution dollar, sorry. Are there attempts to have a distribution system through local markets, businesses across the globe? Um, and they, I don't know, Chris, if you want to answer. It's um it's worth noting that the price so uh, now it's available to buy through our website in Europe and North America. Uh, it's also separately distributed by a third party in Japan. Uh, the price you see on our website reflects the price for Europe and North America. Uh, the price we've always operated a cross subsidy model as a business, um, and uh, the intention is that higher prices charged in countries like say the United Kingdom where we are based. Um, help us to achieve lower prices in countries like, say, Pakistan or Uganda, um, where we've been working recently. And um, it, it does vary by country because of differences in transport costs and local taxes. But I would say that now light is probably typically at, at least 50% uh, lower in price in those sorts of um, in, in that those uh, sorts of countries that I've just mentioned. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, Peter, you have the hands up. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so it's maybe more of an information than a question. I'm trying to establish a group of different countries uh, or national societies who want to work with getting people away from open fire cooking. It's kind of in the line with the, what we heard on the lighting. People need cooking heat and at least for an interim period of the next 10 to 15 years in many cases that will be biomass and today they're just burning it in open fires and many of you probably know this already it is one of the biggest uh, health uh, problems for them it's about 20 years off your lifespan if you do this regularly and it's mothers and children uh, mostly i've started a project on my own not in red cross uh, but in Bhutan, uh, where we are getting schools away from open fire cooking. So I was just interested in hearing if anybody out there is working in this direction. I'm, of course, also thinking about turning credits, climate credits out of this project to be able to take that revenue stream and bring it into the future to pay for, for the projects down the line. So if anybody's interested in this area, already working in this arena, I know Austrian Red Cross is because uh, I'm talking with them and I know I am because I'm trying to to get it through here on health innovation, which is my game in Danish Red Cross. So just throwing the word out there and please contact me or let me know if you want to be part or if you're already doing anything in this area. Thank you so much, Peter. And please share it in the chat um, so people can get in touch with you.
Yes, I will. Thanks. Maybe we will conclude this uh, webinar to keep into the 45 minutes um, as a, as premise to um, Anna let you to the closing remarks. Yes, thanks, Camille. Thank you for this time with us listening to these inspiring stories. Uh, you know how difficult it is sometimes to launch uh, new initiatives, and this is the target that we want to have with Red Social Innovation to share and to impact collectively uh, to the main challenges. Uh, just a few last words, uh, thanks especially to our partners from the Red Cross Red Crescent Movement, the International Federation and the Solferino Academy, all the people that have present their solutions. And just uh, to say that we encourage you to follow us on the social networks and through our uh, website and you we wait you uh, for the next 45 minutes uh, in February. Uh, it's going to be about tech for good. This is a really nice uh, topic for uh, Texas Foundation and how the technology is change social innovation. Um, please, if you have some ideas or you want to contact with us, uh, you just can share uh, your details on the chat or maybe through our website. Thanks a lot.